go. And welcome back to the Dino Vidala Show right now. And it's been too long. It's my friend, Mary Trump's here, author of the best-selling book, Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man Who Gets More Dangerous by the Moment, The Reckoning Our Nation's Trauma and Finding a Way to Heal. She's got the Narrative Adventures podcast and now her newsletter, which she's had for a while, but sign up for it. She's writing a lot of good stuff. It's called The Good in Us on Substack. Go to marytrump.substack.com. Mary, good to see you. It's really good to see you too, Dean, uh, under the circumstances. It, well, look, there's a lot of stuff we can't control, but there's some things we can enjoy, even though we're not controlling that. So this, just yesterday, Donald Trump got fined $10,000 instantly by the judge. He heard what the what Trump had said outside in the hall, what Donald said outside in the hall, clearly attacking the clerk as being partisan. The one rule with the judge is don't attack my staff. And sure enough, he did. And he, what I love is that he made Donald instantly testify. His lawyers couldn't stop it. Because yep. you come up here, testify under oath, and he goes, I'm the trier of fact, and I don't believe you, which is layman speak for you're a liar. And he <laughs> fined him $10,000. Have you ever seen your uncle, the Donald, ever this instantaneous accountability? No, as I said uh, somewhere, it was <laughs> as if for the first time in 77 years, the toddler had been given a timeout. And uh, as you know, he didn't react particularly well to it. No, I, he st the word stormed out. They say, I'm not sure if he stormed out of because of Michael Cohen or he stormed out because of this kind oh, of thing. It was because of that. Oh, it was? Um, I think the quote is he stormed out in a huff. <laughs> uh, and his, I'm sure he yelled at his lawyers. Well, why didn't you protect me? Yeah. They couldn't do anything. The judge says, come up here. So. I mean, do you think he goes back to that, that court much? I don't know if he's there today. Do you think he's going to keep going back and risking this? I mean, he's got to, on a personal human dynamic level, I imagine it's got to be very painful to him. He's actually been held accountable. Yeah. I, you know, again, the re one reason he reacted so badly is because th there have been very few, if any, circumstances in his entire life in which he didn't have control of the room. Um so to have to sit there and take it must have been extremely painful. I, I'm guessing he he regretted having shown up. Um, I don't know that he's there today either. But um, what people need to understand is he doesn't have to be. He right. showed he showed up voluntarily. Uh, and remember, this is the only case he's shown up for. He didn't bother going to the E. Jean Carroll civil trial. I I think ever. Um, so he is putting himself in this position. I believe he was there um, at the beginning to control the spin. And over the last few days, he was there simply to uh, stare down Michael Cohn, um, not recognizing, maybe he's starting to, I don't know, but not recognizing that he can't intimidate people like Michael Cohn anymore. Although, as our friend and fellow Nerd Avenger, Jen Tao pointed out, He's using Cohen as a proxy to intimidate other people. So that's part of it. Yeah, but look, Michael Cohen's been to prison. You know, like mm -hmm. there's no intimidating. This guy right. went to jail for Donald mm -hmm. because of Donald, a, a large part. There were some other crimes unrelated to Donald, to be fair, but a lot were because of Donald. Mm -hmm. You're not going to intimidate him. What, what, what mob movie is Donald watching to think like he's going to sit in the courtroom and stare at the guy and the guy's not going to testify. Donald doesn't have that kind of army. He doesn't have mobsters who are going to go out there. They're certainly not going to come to New York. I don't know how he actually thinks, honestly, like I don't understand his thinking that he can sit there and his presence actually going to make Michael Cohen not tell the truth under oath. No, no, but there are, there are other witnesses to come who, who may not be so uh, defended against Donald's bullshit. Uh, you know, there, there are how many other, I'm losing track. There are many other cases and many other witnesses to come who may, unlike Cohn, be um, testifying under duress and, and may not have the same resources and may not have the same legal kinds of legal teams and, and you know, may not feel as, um, as what's the word I'm looking for? Um, protected against Donald and, you know, we've talked about this many times before, his fanatical followers who are willing to protect him against all enemies imagined and real. Are you surprised, like some of Trump supporters have called up 
and threatened the judge. One was arrested who had threatened Judge Shutkin. Other the prosecutors now have 24 hour security as a result. The four main prosecutors, according to the New York Times recently. But are you surprised there has not been acts of violence by Trump supporters to defend him? And do you think it's more of a time period, like maybe later if he's getting closer to get convicted or actually will be conv is convicted? We might see some. I'm not surprised. Uh, I mean, it, it cuts both ways. I wouldn't be surprised if something did happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised that nothing has yet. I'm grateful that nothing has yet. Uh, but we're just getting started. I mean, again, with the exception of the E. Jean Carroll case, which, by the way, didn't put him in personal jeopardy. It just right. put him in financial jeopardy. Same thing with this one, uh, which is also much more important to Donald than any of the other cases because it it involves his alleged uh, empire. Um, we're, it's still early days. A, a verdict hasn't been rendered and we are um, at a period of time when he's still leading the Republican primary by, like, I don't know, 50 points or something absurd. Uh, so the threat theme seems theoretical. Uh, and I think he's happy at the moment just grifting more money off of them. If, by the way, the judge in New York ultimately decides at the end of this that the Trump New York empire goes into receivership and has to be sold off, will you join with me in buying Trump Tower? We can rename it Mary Trump Tower? I Actually, I, I, absolutely, because I'm guessing it will be going for pennies on the dollar. <laughs> and I have a better idea. Let's name it E.G. and Carol Tower. Oh, and she deserves it. And then she can rent yeah. it out if she wants to make the yeah. five million at least that she's owed plus interest. So EJC, mm -hmm. say, EJC, I like that very much. I'm chatting with you know, Mary, Trump. Oh, sorry, Dean. I'll okay. I'll take I'll take the thirty thousand square foot triplex. Oh, the one that's actually ten thousand feet, but he claims it's thirty thousand feet. That one? That's yeah. not bad. Yeah. Look, I I have no idea. Turn it into an animal shelter or something. <laughs> something he hates. I, does he hate animals? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. I, you know oh, more about I, him I, on a personal level. I don't know. You know, so look in the January 6th case, Judge Chutkin imposed a gag order, lifted it to allow the attorneys, just being a, a fair, very fair judge, yeah. allowed so that the lawyers for Trump can make an argument that to put it on hold until the appeal is considered. And now, right away, he attacks Mark Meadows, who's absolutely a witness, and attacks tax Jack Smith again as deranged. And went after Mark Meadows again today. Recently, there was just another posting that I saw the news covering. The How important is it that Judge Chutkin, though, reimpose this? Or do you think she's playing the long game? Let him keep saying stuff. And she goes, you know what? That's it. You're going in, which is the dream. And in means holding yeah. cell. Uh, listen, I, I'm really sick of this long game nonsense. Uh, you know, I'm happy. I don't know if that's the word. I think it's a good thing that Judge Engeron in New York City, and I know I'm mispronouncing his name, but I know, don't know how to sounds pronounce good. it. Um, sounds good, right? Uh, I'm. It's a good thing that he's imposing these fines, but uh, anybody else would be in jail for what Donald has done in terms of the contempt he's shown to these these judges and the courtrooms. So I understand that given the circumstances, they have to dot every I and cross every T and, and tread very carefully, but I'm really tired of it. And if, if anything is, is gonna get somebody killed, it's allowing Donald to keep stirring up uh, vitriol against people who were potential witnesses, people who are, are testifying against them, people who are um, making plea deals that will uh, put Donald in more hot water. So why don't we just nip it in the bud and make it clear that there's a line even he's not allowed to cross? We're not there yet. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. You think, I mean, deep down, do you have more concerns there'll be violence next year at this time? in the last few weeks of the election, if Donald is the nominee, in that his supporters can think, well, I could commit violence, and if Donald wins, he'll pardon me, just like he's promised to pardon the January 6th attackers. Yeah, I'm more worried about the aftermath of the election, um, but at this point, things are so charged, and uh, as, as you know, as well as anybody else, it's not just this, it's everything else that's going on. Uh, you know, there's so much dissension and uh, hatred and division 
that's that's just feels like it's it's coming at us from every single angle. Uh, so this is just going to continue to build over the next year. And Donald's not very good at many things, but he's really good at knowing where the pressure points are and where to press. <laughs> it, it's a sad trait that he's mastered. So yeah. I want to talk about something. You know, the media now is starting to pick up on Donald saying things like he defeated Obama twice. And then he confused George Bush and Jeb Bush, but not in terms of their name, like who they were. He really did. And then mm -hmm. this week he talked about in the speech that, you know, Victor Orban, he said, you should see this guy. He's the leader of Turkey. And then later mentioned Hungary, but then said they, they he's a leader of a country that has a front with Russia and neither Turkey, Turkey nor Hungary do. Like right. you, you've honestly, I mean, look, you have a unique position. You know Donald from years ago. You were family members. I mean, is this different in that it's not lying? Like this is affirmative statements that are not lies to help himself. It really seems a level of confusion, detachment from reality. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. So, is it anything new to you, or is it the same old thing? I, I, I do think it's new. Um, but I'll say with this caveat, uh, you know, when I knew Donald, he did, he only ever talked about things that were of interest to him. <laughs> so, and, and whenever he was giving interviews, he was, he was given so much deference that, you know, there were never follow-up questions and the, there were softball questions. So he, he couldn't be wrong in a way, if you know what I mean. So, uh, this does seem different though. Um, he, really doesn't have a handle on uh, the the state of the wider world. And you seem to be one of the very, very few people who keeps calling this stuff out because, I mean, it was bad enough when, and not that this has changed, but, you know, when, when uh, corporate media sort of make allowances for his bigotry and uh, his, his, violent tendencies as if it's all just baked in and what else what else can we expect from the guy they're doing the same thing with these potentially um cognitive issues uh you know well you know that's just donald rambling that's what he does and yet on the other hand they make a big deal out of joe biden taking a walk on the beach uh for five minutes after traveling for four days straight you know so um it it is disturbing that attention is getting paid. The reason is even more disturbing because that's just Donald. It's not helpful. And you know, to your point, Media Matters, which is a great liberal watchdog group, just had a study that just came out. They looked from April to September, the five biggest papers in the country. I don't know if you saw this: L.A. Times, New York Times, USA Today, and the number of times Biden's age was mentioned versus Donald, two to one, about the age or things about aging or being old are two to one and they're three years apart. And that's where the media, it becomes like the sheep mentality. We see it all the time with corporate media and I think they, they follow each other. So no, we can get in trouble. Like, well, everyone's talking about it. So I have to talk yeah. about it, that type of thing. Where if you go against the way you get it wrong, maybe you lose your job. Maybe someone up an executive up there doesn't like it, but it's remark. It's real. We're not, it's no longer like subjective, objectively speaking, the corporate media in print, yeah. Two to one talking about Joe Biden's age and being old. And and not only are they are they lying essentially, uh, you know, it's a lie of omission to only to speak about Joe Biden's age and ignore Don and ignore Donald's. But they're also just speaking about it completely out of context. Yes, Joe Biden's old, but look what he's accomplished. Donald Trump is three only three years younger. And he's a fascist who may be, well be losing his mind, you know, I, and who clearly doesn't have the best interests of the United States at heart. I mean, they none of right. that even gets mentioned. It's it's quite it's really stunning, Dean, because I literally in a race between an 80 year old and a 77 year old, you know, these two old white guys, I cannot think of anything less important uh, than how well they are. Right. But yet the media, the media, to the bigger point, they're three years apart. Yet the media is Biden's old, Biden's old. Look at Trump. Yeah. There's a reason Trump is not Donald's not doing five rallies a week like he used to. There's a reason he's not doing the debates. Yeah. I honestly think, Mary, 
I don't know if we've talked about this. My view is his refusal to the debates are twofold. One, a continued rejection of democratic norms. How dare you ask me questions? Two, to protect him from being on a stage for two hours where he can't escape. And yep. you're going to see him and hear him and watch him meander and wander. And the other candidates are calling him out going, that's just wrong what you're saying. I, like literally factually wrong what's going on. I think that's two part. And the media is like, well, he's not in the debates because he's winning by so much. There's something else going on. I, I don't know why the corporate, it makes me very upset. We've well, talked about this. And we should be, we should be upset because again, it's, it's just normalizing the deeply abnormal and dangerous. And I, and actually, Dean, I think we just answered the earlier question. Why is Donald Trump in, in a courtroom instead of out doing rallies? and claiming he has to be in the courtroom because it's a good excuse for him not to have to show up. Mm -hmm. He sits in court all day and says nothing because, well, he's in court, so he's not supposed to be speaking. He goes out for a, a one minute rant, uh, repeating the same things he always says. You know, the person on the stand is a lie, it's a disgrace, the judges, have, whatever. Uh, so he doesn't have to perform in the same way that he would at a rally. And he's got this built-in excuse, which is a lie because he doesn't have to be. And so he it's it's sort of this um, you know, two for one. He can lie about having to be in the courtroom and blame the system for keeping him away from his people. And he also gets a lot of free media coverage. He knows that yeah. by coming to New York, yep. walking out, and they come out and they want to hear everything he says and they report on it. As opposed to going to a rally, which costs you money, which he's financially, they're not doing great, the campaign, because they're spending millions and tens of millions on legal fees. Yep. So Biden outraised them huge numbers last quarter. The Biden campaign outraised them. And Biden doesn't spend any money on legal fees in four different cases, but 91 felony counts, plus this case, plus yeah. the Eugene Carroll case, plus Colorado. I just had the Secretary of State of Colorado on yesterday, Jenna Griswold. Mm -hmm. And Monday begins a trial. The judge yesterday denied the last motion that would prevent the trial. On Monday, we're actually going to have a trial on did Donald Trump violate Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? And first, they're going to have to determine was it an insurrection as contemplated by the 14th Amendment? And second, then did Donald Trump engage in it? This this could ban him from the ballot. This trial might only be a, ma a week. It's a judge trial to make yeah. a determination of law. This is really big. And the Secretary of State's like, this is a big case. I'm surprised more people aren't covering it. Well, yeah, that's another another really good question. And we see similar movements in Wisconsin yep. and Michigan. Mm -hmm. um, and people need to understand not, not the, sorry, not simply in the context of what's happening at the state level, but as, as an indictment of the federal government's failure to police itself. This is happening because the DOJ, for whatever reason, failed in this instance to prosecute, to investigate and prosecute sitting members of Congress whom we now know are seditionists and insurrectionists and still sitting in our government. So this it is left to the states. Uh, I think it's, it's very, very important and I don't know, Dean, knowing what we know, how, how do we not believe, one, that it was an insurrection, and two, that Donald is an insurrectionist, and three, if we believe in the Constitution, according to the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, he should not be allowed ever to hold office again, and there should be a domino effect going down the ranks. Yeah, it's not like he engaged in the insurrection. He was the insurrection. Right. There is no insurrection. If Donald Trump simply accepts the loss, nothing right. else happens afterwards. He just right. makes the time to leave and he whines a little bit about it and leaves on January 20th and there's no attack on January 6th. The only reason is he called people literally um, saying it's going to be wild. Be there. Gave them the speech saying we're going down there. He said there's going to be a guy in the office who shouldn't be there. We can't let that happen. Literally saying we can't let this happen numerous times. There was no peaceful way not to let that the vote be certified when you're giving a speech at noon and Congress meeting at one, the only option was violence. Yep. And again, it goes, I don't want to relitigate Merrick Garland. I'm on record about Merrick Garland. There's no need to go back there, but well, if yeah, they had done it be. earlier. It's not right now. Right. It's just, so, so I, but you're on, like there are some Democrats who've called my show who are very sincere about, look, I'd rather we beat him at the polls. Others have said, 
even like big, I think David Frum had an article about you've got to defeat them at the polls to put an end to mag. I'm like, we did that in 2020. We beat them. There's no beating them. That it's is a fascist movement. That is so ignorant. It's, I know. it's mind boggling because yeah, let's leave it to chance again, guys. How many elections, Dean, can we have that are the most important elections of our lifetime? This is what we don't, what people don't seem to understand. Even if we win, if we win by such small margins, we are constantly fighting our rear flank, knowing that if we lose the next time around, it's the democracy's over, autocracy is going to be in the ascendant. And not only are we con continually fighting the same battle that we shouldn't be fighting, we are prevented from strengthening our democracy for four more years because we're continuing to fight the people who tried to earn overturn our government because we never got rid of them. Yep. I'm not angry about it though. It's no, I mean, it's almost surreal, isn't it? On something like forget politics, everything. If you attempt a coup in America and you would incite a terrorist attack on the Capitol. And you could just walk free for years and raise millions of dollars and be the leader of the other party to be their nominee and finally get charged with crimes, but not in, not charged in, for years afterwards. It's almost surreal that this guy can lead the GOP and, and the media's like, oh, I guess that's the guy, the candidate, without every day talking about this guy attempted a coup. This guy's out on bail. They never use the term out on bail. I write articles right. all the time. Donald right. Trump, who's out on bail, is campaigning right. in Iowa today. He's literally out on bail. I'm not making yep. it up. Those are the facts. Yep. So I, it is surreal. Like, And what is also surreal is that polls show him and Biden neck and neck, poll after poll. Yeah, some show Trump winning, some show Biden winning. But at the end of the day, the average is they're neck and neck. And I mean, does it concern you or is this a year from the election and it's not really about Trump, Donald, it's more about Biden's approval rating? Of course it concerns me because the re one of the reasons the polls are the way they are is because the corporate media is not doing its job. And they can, as you say, they continue to normalize everything. You, I've never once seen in, in a corporate media outlet, he's out on bail or describing him as an insurrectionist or describing him as somebody who's stolen top secret government documents, et cetera, or as a rapist or on and on and on, a fraud, for example. So, um, you know, I mean, this country is really good at that. Like, you never hear the founding fathers described as slaveholders. Uh, so, you know, um, we we do like to whitewash things, don't we? But there's so much at stake here. And the problem now is that it isn't just Donald who's the problem. It's, it's the entire party. We need to wipe out metaphorically speaking electorally speaking this entire party uh what just happened yesterday with this over the last three weeks with the speakership should be sending chills down everybody's spine our hair should be on fire and we should be acting as if we are going to be a fascist dictatorship in at the end of 2024 if we don't take over the house by like 60 seats and win the Senate majority in a way that the majority actually matters. I couldn't agree with you more. I was just posting today that MAGA and a Democratic Republic cannot coexist, period. And, you know, nope. I know we have to qualify. Of course, we mean electorally. We're, that's how you defeat them. But we have to crush them. And and to your point here, before we wrap up, that it's not just Donald. Look at who they not they just elected unanimously in the House. Mike Johnson, who was a key guy in the electoral uh, scheme to overturn the election. He did it lawyer-like, writing the amicus yep. brief and supporting yep. that. He is a Christian nationalist in the truest sense of the world. He wants yep. his religion to be the law. A horrible anti-LGBT bigot. Yep. Really bad. Wants to force women to carry every embryo at a term. And that's who they are. And they're proud of that. This is a really dangerous moment for our nation. So even at times I get disappointed with President Biden, I'm like, I got to be all in because the stakes are too high. Yeah. And 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 again, uh, I think we had this conversation a week or so ago. It It's terrible always to be um, saying in the position of, well, you know, things could be worse. But in this case, it is it is true exponentially. Things could be so much worse and what we need to do is put people in power 
who will make things better. And we, we keep failing to do that. I'm not talking about Biden. I'm talking about having enough of a majority to force right. Democrats to make things better. And, and look, Democrats did some great stuff when they had the House for yeah. the first two years. And yeah. if we can do this again in the next two years in 25, 26, we can do some great stuff. Well, Mary, thanks for being on. And again, the, the newsletter I subscribe to, it's really great. It's called The Good in Us. It's on Substack, marytrump.substack.com. It's free. Sign up for it. What do you got to lose? It's free. You like it? you know. So thanks, Mary. Thanks so much for being on. It's always great chatting with you. Thanks, Dean. I appreciate it. Take care. Have a great day.